You've landed on The Substance, a podcast aimed at being biblical, thoughtful, and human. Join us here every other week as we engage the culture without the culture war. I'm your host, Philip Marinello, saying Merry Christmas, especially if you're listening to this when it drops. A little uh, Christmas Eve drop here for you. We'll probably drop it earlier in the day, so I don't know if people listen day of or what their holiday plans or schedule is looking like, but happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everyone. This is, uh, it's been quite a year. Uh, we've gone through several changes. Yeah, the show has had some changes this year, transitioning. It was sad to see Vince and Trevor step back, but I'm very grateful for everybody uh, who has continued. We, we love having you, and I am exceptionally grateful for our editor, Dave, who has helped us keep this show coming out. Yeah, I've got definitely have some skills, uh, a joke about the uh, networking being a spiritual gift of mine. I'm able to get good people to agree to talk with me, but if I it was up to me to edit the show, I, I don't know. I, I'm certain that the show would not sound as good. Uh, it probably would not come out as regularly. So many, many thanks to Dave. For those of you new here, The Substance is a Christian variety show where every other week we usually have one or more, in this case today here, interesting guests, people who are smart, thoughtful, interesting, engaged in work that we think has value. And then we talk about something related to faith, culture, the arts. Previous guests include folks like Film Spotting's Josh Larson, New York Times film critic Alyssa Wilkinson. Uh, We had Mike White, host of the Projection Booth podcast, and our friends from Letterboxd, Slim and Mitchell. Today, we've got the brothers from Saints in Cinema, Tim and Jay Winterstein. Tim is a pastor. He's a Lutheran pastor up in Washington, and Jay lives in California. He's got a degree in film. Jay is the senior programmer of the Newport Beach Film Festival. We actually talk here towards the end. I think it's in the show. Maybe a chance where we do something uh, at the end of this year. Um with them over there at their film festival. So guys who uh, love the Lord, who love film, and who spend a lot of time thinking about uh, film and faith and and substantive cinema. So it was an excellent conversation, uh, and I hope you guys all enjoy. If you haven't yet, and if you're newer to the show um, and you're looking for something Christmassy, sorry we weren't able to get one uh, in time. Hopefully soon we will have one. We just happen to have some delays on our Christmas episode. Previous years, if you want to go back and check the feed, um, with the aforementioned Alyssa Wilkinson, who's now with the New York Times, we did um, Greta Gerwig's Little Women from 2019. A couple years ago, we did Elf, and then we did another one that I kind of consider a Christmas movie now. We did The Matrix Resurrections with Eugene Park, I believe, a year or so ago when that came out. So those are some of the Christmas-specific ones we've done. So if you have interest in that, be sure to check those shows out. So here's my conversation with Tim and Jay. Hope you enjoy. Well, welcome to, a, I guess, a joint episode of Saints in Cinema and the Substance. This is fun, guys. I, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to go. Exciting for us. I've been waiting for this one. Yeah, it's always good in getting another voice on the podcast and hearing other people's perspectives. I mean, I love talking to my brother, but it's always good hearing other people <laughs> as well. So Tim and Jay, and I, I'm happy to do it for the, the Saints in Cinema folks, but Tim and Jay, guys want to just... 60 seconds, your movie biography and Saints in Cinema, kind of where you're coming from, from the faith perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm Tim Winterstein and I'm a Lutheran pastor in central Washington State. And I think probably everything I do with movies probably came via Jay, um, just in terms of, I mean, you know, who doesn't like to watch movies, right? But I think involved with the Newport Beach Film Festival that came, obviously, Jay was there. He's been there like, what, 16, 17 years, something like that. And, you know, then then slowly sort of thinking about movies more, I wrote some stuff for, for a few years for uh, called The Jagged Word, mostly on movies. And then now I'm starting a PhD in film and theology and culture. So I'm Jay Winterstein. As Tim mentioned, I've been with the uh, Newport Beach Film Festival for, I think, 17 years. And I studied film and media studies over at UC Irvine. I'm down in Southern California right now. So yeah, I'm a senior programmer with the festival, and so I'm one of the reviewers, watch a lot of the films, and then help decide which films go into the festival. And uh, yeah, I've been doing that for 17 years, and I mean, besides that, my full-time job is a corrosion technician, but that's not... Oh, okay. So you're not even full-time, so it's a it's a real passion for you then? Yeah, which, which I kind of like. You know, I have my nine-to-five that I do and pays the bills, and then I get to... 
I get to do the film festival, you know, and it's volunteer, but I love it. It's my, you know, as Tim and I say, it's our favorite week of the year. So we get to go out and hang out in Newport Beach Film Festival and watch movies and meet all the filmmakers. And it's exciting. I love it. I mean, is the focus on premieres or do they get some, do you guys get some of the big names? It sounds like from listening to some of your episodes, you've had some creators of note pass through the festival. Yeah. And it's been actually last year was kind of our, our big, I don't know, coming out year due to COVID. We had always been in taking place in April. And the thing about when studios release films, they tend to release their better films towards the end of the year to keep them fresh for, you know, Oscar voters. So that's typically when the better films would come out. And so when we had our film festival in April, I mean, we'd get some good films every once in a while. Or, I mean, (laughs) we'd still get good (laughs) films. Sorry. (laughs) Good films, but not not known. Right. Right. We didn't get a lot of the big films because, you know, a lot of the studios were holding off or like, well, we're going to wait for this, this, and this. Save until the last quarter. Right. And then so when COVID came the first year, COVID, we went online. And then the next year, we went, we pushed it back to October. That was kind of, well, there's still a few restrictions. So we really want to do, we don't want to do the online festival. We want to do an in-person festival. And in order to do that, we need to like push it back. And that way we can, you know, have an on in-person festival. So it got pushed back to October. And really it was one of the best things that happened to us because we got, we were able to get a lot of the bigger films. And that's that's exciting. Yeah. It's carried over. Um, We've had a great relationship with Netflix and Apple. And so yeah, we're hoping to keep that going. It's been it's been great, and we get a lot of the the talent that comes out. You know, a lot of these studios will push their pal- their talent and say, "Hey, to go out and promote the film." So it's been really good for us. Yeah, we had That's some good awesome. big names last year, and uh, and then this year we had uh, Rain Wilson came out and talked about his book at at one of the events, and then uh, we had. Oh, he's uh, definitely in the in the spirituality world. I've listened to some of his stuff recently. Interesting yeah. guy. Yeah, Soul Boom, I think, is his book that he talked about. Um, and then, uh, what, Beverly Cleary? <laughs> Judy Bloom, close. <laughs> <laughs> Judy Bloom came out. Um, it was <laughs> – we were really hoping to build off last year, but I think um, – I don't know. We got a little hiccup with the strike. You know, the strike was going on during the festival, so we weren't – we didn't get a lot of the big names we were kind of hoping for, but we still um, – I mean, we still had a great festival, still had – you know, some names. And Mark, Mark Ronson came out, did a little talk, a bunch of other people as well. We met, we met Patricia Clarkson. That was Oh, we did. Yeah. Me. Yeah. She was great. <clears throat> when we said so, you guys met the, the guy from Banshee's of Inishir and of Inishir and I was just yeah. listening to one on that. We met, I think we both at, both at separate times met Barry Keegan. Oh, um, he's having a year this year. Question here. So who's okay. the older brother? <laughs> is the Tim, the pastor okay. Tim is the older one. He's pastor got me. Tim. He's got me by two years. Okay. <laughs> are you guys the extent of the siblings or are there more? There are three There's more. Three others. Oh, wow. Okay. So Tim's brothers. the oldest. Tim's the oldest, then me, and then we have three other brothers below us. <laughs> got it. Five brothers <laughs> spread wow. out across do, the- Do any of the other three come out for the festival? Actually, what? Two years ago, our youngest brother came out, and then he's thinking about- Because this year is the 25th coming up next year. In, a, Ooh, in, in October? October, yeah. If you're not and, doing uh, anything, yeah. See if I could get a studio to, to pay to get me out there to cover something. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, yep. yep. We fun. got press. We got press passes. Um, well, that's cool. Okay, I figured Tim was older, but when he said you got him into it, I wasn't sure. And beards can be deceiving, so <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> right. wasn't quite sure. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Philip. I grew. I just grew up loving movies. I mean. Both my parents worked, so I was a big library kid. So, I mean, I was getting a stack of books and a stack of VHS tapes many days a week and just just spending a lot of time. Like, I'm a big narrative guy. Like, movies are probably, like, my my greatest passion. But, I mean, like, I love stories. Um, and, yeah, ever ever since I can remember, I probably saw my first movie when I was, like, three or younger, but I mean, like I, I remember loving movies from a young age, not just like, Oh, we'll go to see a couple movies a year. Like, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, like when like toy story or lion King or some of those big Disney movie came out. So like I would get like everybody in my family 
and any of my friends' parents, whenever we're hanging out, like I would lobby to go see it. Like I saw mm-hmm. movies over and over and over in the theater when I could. Mm-hmm. And like, it's always been huge for me. And then, yeah, I, every now and then I would have like, I would actually like get subscriptions to like film journals. Like back when IMDB had message boards, I was on there a ton. Like it's, it's always been something I've been not just enjoyed watching, but enjoyed like really engaging with. So with the dawn of, I mean, I listened to podcasts a long time ago. Like I feel like most people in the last five years or so have come around to podcasts, but I mean, I, I I love the form. And then when we got the podcast going, we're like, okay, substantive cinema, we don't want to only do that, but it was, it's been something that we've done from the beginning of the show and something that is definitely going to continue and maybe even to a greater degree in the future. So, I mean, it's something that I'm, I'm very passionate about. And I think that cinema can be many, many things. So excited for the conversation with you guys today. When you, when you describe on your podcast, substantive cinema, like what's, what's going on in your mind? Like what, 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 what would be some characteristics of that? I had a conversation uh, a month or so ago with uh, Josh Nadeau, who runs the Instagram account Sword and Pencil. And one of the things that in preparing for that, he's a big um, proponent, I guess, of like the transcendentals. And it was a nice, like when we had that conversation, it kind of crystallized like the transcendentals being goodness, truth, and beauty. And I think that that's really it. What is good? What is true? What is beautiful? Um, oftentimes there is an element of spirituality, but also if we are, are living presently, like there's an element of spirituality in, you don't have to be a religious person to like have (laughs) spiritual things affect one's life. So, I mean, we, yeah, I think that goodness, truth, and beauty, like it doesn't have to be super religious. Uh, and we're, I'm excited for that. <laughs> you guys are like, okay, let's pick some like quote unquote serious and some quote unquote frivolous. I thought about trying to undercut it and having like things that like seem totally frivolous, but that are like backdoor substantive. Like there is some substance in the ones that I pick, but they are a little bit more fun. But I think that anything that is done well has value. And people love movies. So I thought that that would be fun to both talk about things that are going on in the culture like we don't just chase new stuff but we're also not only doing like roger ebert's great movie list like we're doing a little yeah. bit of everything yeah. we've got like oscar winning stuff we've got brand new stuff we've got like when soul came out on disney plus right away like the pixar movie we covered that like we've done very old movies we've done foreign movies we've done like the paul schrader and the terrence malick movies like the ones that are very explicitly spiritual but i mean it's it's a yeah. the whole thing for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the, and, and actually when I was, you know, like watching uh, the ones I hadn't seen of your list and then like, like thinking about that, like it's, it's very clear, like you, there's not a firm line there. I mean, in fact, I was thinking like, what, what would be frivolous? Well, okay. So first thing comes to mind is like a comedy, but, but if you think about comedies, a lot of them have some, there's something going on underneath it or else it wouldn't, make a connection with people. So, so I think that's something that we should talk about. Well, I did note it. Well, cause I started thinking about what kind of genres are uh, related to, you know, like a quote unquote frivolous film. But I did notice like each of us, when we gave our list of, you know, too frivolous, you know, too serious, we each had one comedy, you know? And I think um, along with comedy horror and yeah, comedy and horror is kind of what I went to. I was like, okay, let me pick like my first list the first two that I had were both comedies that were kind of like along similar lines. I was like, no, like let me pick some other stuff and ended up picking some stuff that were more like top of mind this year. So I felt like I could mm. talk about them better. Cause I wasn't really able to go back and rewatch anything. So, I mean, here, here's, here was my original thought was that when I first started thinking about like more graduate school, I was thinking I can't get away with doing something about film like that. It's like there's a something in the back of my head that says that's not serious enough to do like serious work on. And then at the same time, so so there's kind of, I'm I'm always of kind of two minds. I think that's just movies, right? Like that kind of phrase, like there's that kind of thought. But then at the very same time, I'm thinking about movies that actually change the way I think about things. 
And so it's not, Mm -hmm. there's, it's not just, it's not just movies. Like they actually can change the way I think or what I think about or something I didn't know about or something like that. So that was my original thought with sort of the topic of like, are movies serious or frivolous? Because I think a lot of Christians might say, you know, it's either just entertainment it's just it's just something that you watch to like pass time or like let's go to the movies because we don't have anything else to do or this seems like a fun thing to do uh, or there's like two sides of the agenda like uh, this is the Hollywood agenda like they, which <laughs> which I think I think a lot of Christians like to have that idea like this is a Hollywood agenda and sure. they have very probably in their minds clear things about what that means um, although I'm not sure it's always articulated. And then at the other end of things, it's like, here's a Christian agenda. So we're going to, the church is going to sell out this theater and we're going to buy out all the tickets and we're going to bring our whole church to it. Well, and every year, like that's a tried and true thing. Every year there's a couple of big random hits where they're like, what was number two at the box office again? This movie that nobody's ever heard of. Oh, that's got to be like, it sells out to churches. Yes. Mm -hmm. But, but like in the form itself, like they're doing the exact same thing. It's the same formula. Like it's like, right? It's like let's. How are we going to make money? We're going to sell this to somebody who wants to buy it. I mean, it's, to me, it seems like the exact same thing. I don't, I don't know. Well, in my mind, like cinema is, it's just a medium. So like, and I understand people who don't particularly like it, and that's fine in a way. But I mean, I feel like some people kind of tell on themselves when they're like, oh, like there's nothing of value or substance there. And it's like, well, if your engagement with watching things is like every other night you plop down on the couch and watch the same recycled episode of Law and Order, slightly mm-hmm. tweaked every night, like, yeah, that's not so, like, or any kind of network TV that like has one format that does it over and over and over and over. There's like 10,000 episodes of NCIS and then like six spinoffs. That that maybe it's fine. Good for them. They're set up for life. And here and there, there might be some substantive things in there. But like, if that's your your thing, like, okay, like I, I get why you would think that. But just to maybe stretch a little, like even if you're just like a TV watcher, like there's plenty of stuff, even just at home, if you have the FX or Hulu or HBO or whatever, like there's, there's a lot of things of substance out there if you uh, just look a little bit. So I'm curious to hear what, when the idea of came, you know, came out for doing a serious film, what was your, is there a criteria that you guys had in mind? Um, Cause when, you know, looking over the films and trying to narrow it down, I think, I mean, there's a couple things that came to mind for me that kind of set it up, like such as, you know, questions it'll raise or, um, you know, what does this film do for me? So I'm, I'm interested to hear like kind of, your criteria or what, what makes a quote unquote serious film, you know, something that separates it from like a pure entertainment kind of film. For me, it was, there were movies that I watched them and I think about for days or weeks or months, or I, I always refer to them or something like that. Like it, it had some sort of impact on me where I'm like, that's a movie that everybody should see or, you know, this, but of course, it won't have the same impact on everybody that it had on me. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I like, and related to this like idea of Christian movies, like for me, silence and a hidden life, uh, which I think we might, so we might talk about those, um, you know, those, those movies, those were the most profound Christian movies that maybe I've seen in the last say five years, 10 years. Um, like for, they had, they're so, so, but I don't, nobody, no churches were selling out theaters for those movies. And to me, that's a, that's a, there's something wrong with there. Well, I'll say for me, and then I, I'll say this, and then maybe we should each reveal our four, and then we can kind of go from there. For me, the serious ones, I thought more of as, in, in my scheme that I'm thinking about more and more of the goodness, truth, and beauty, the serious ones, in my mind, I, the truth is the primary thing, like, what is this? What does this movie have to say? Like that kind of bumps it up higher on the serious. And for me, the more frivolous one is just fun. Yeah. And the a great thing about like having fun or being entertained is that there can also be like the substance is maybe optional, but like, so that's kind of how I did it. Like the frivolous 
like what can we like what do we enjoy that's maybe more frivolous versus what do we enjoy that's more serious for me the serious like was heavy on the truth either i mean i don't like something that's super preachy but like you can tell that and we're going to share with our picks here that like it is dealing with things that are like deep and true and for me the frivolous was more what's what's just fun to watch so uh j or tim you want to share your serious and frivolous picks and we can kind of yeah so i mean the frivolous ones i feel like there's all sorts of things i could have chosen uh and i think the one of them was the same as what jay actually did choose but um i I always, and maybe it's just like college nostalgia, but Boondock <laughs> Saints for me, like uh, <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, "Oh like, man, that's a college just, pick." Yeah, it, it totally, it's a totally college pick. Uh, like we watch it all the time. I don't know, just like it's just like I don't know, and it has it has quotable lines, and it's sort of like it it has a pretense to sort of, uh, I think a little bit of like. There's like all sorts of weird. It's one of the ones. So I was reading this article about religion and violence. Uh, it it did, and it wasn't mentioned, of course. Uh, but you know that's one where they sort of just mix it all together, and you're like, okay. And then uh, the more the older I get, the more I think about it. I'm like, that's really not good. Um, but very kind I of ha- crudely and amateurly, but it is all there. Like, yeah. And that's why when you watch it and you're in college, and if you're not seen a lot of movies like oh this is but like willem something. defoe willem defoe i think is great is still in that movie I st- there was a firefight like that that whole thing <laughs> like uh, i think willem defoe that does hilarious. come up now and then in my life he's, i do i do think about that yeah, line he's hilarious and uh so that's one and then one that oh, i just have sorry. fun watching every year is christmas vacation sorry i just no. sorry i want to dip in real quick yes, um do it for boondock saints i think it's interesting in that this one also kind of dips its toes into the kind of serious one because it kind of takes on this sure. social justice thing that, you know, I think we've been seeing more and more, um, you know, lately in the real world, but it, you know, so it, it kind of puts out a, you know, almost a serious tone, like putting out a, Hey, do the ends justify the means kind of idea. So I, um, I mean, obviously I love it. You know, it's a great time to see <laughs> people get shot up, but I, but I think it is, but it is one, I think that kind of, you know, maybe toes the line and maybe tries to not even tries any, to, it, yeah, tries to, um, put it, put itself in that series and put out this, you know, Hey, maybe the maybe second one is, the second one is really horrible. I saw it when it came out and I literally remember nothing about it. <laughs> I, Other than I, at the sting at the end, maybe they go, I don't know. It comes back. Maybe I, it's sort of like they, you know, and what, don't what's, remember that, it at all. what's the one guy's name? Who's the, who's his, their uncle who kind of like shows or the dad who shows up. Is that Billy know. Connolly? Wait, yeah. Cliff. Like I love, I love Billy Connolly and stuff. He's hilarious, but, um, He's like they, they get closer to their parents or something. They go back to Ireland in the second one, something like that. I don't even know. But no, I, I love Boondock Saints in college and I have not yeah. seen it in quite some time. <laughs> I think I have it on DVD. I should probably check it out and I'll probably be disappointed. But uh, in my mind, it's a legend in my own mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I like just just the lines, uh, you know, again, there's certain certain things that uh and it's just over the top, like crazy, uh, you know, it's not something I'm like, well, let's, uh, let's do a paper on that one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You're not writing your, your PhD no. on this. <laughs> no. Um, but anyway, I, I, I remember it as fun and a Christmas, Christmas vacation since we're coming up close to the season. Yep. Uh, that's another one. I just, I just have fun watching that. Chris, there's all sorts of great scenes and quotable lines and so. it's got great characters. I think, you know, you can find yes. someone that either, you know, or, you know, someone you can relate to, or like I've been in that situation or I know someone who's been in that situation or someone who's acted like that. And you've I, and I think a, that's you've what electrocuted makes... a cat, Jay. Haven't you? <laughs> I mean, haven't we all who has not <laughs> <laughs> parked our RVs out front? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, just mean, a lot of great characters in that but one. But as we were saying, that one touches on serious stuff too. Like, right? Like the stress of the holidays and like, am I going to be able to afford this and make my fa- deal with my family? And like all those things have like a serious side to them. So it's not like it's, you know, again, it's not completely frivolous. And I think that that's something that, you know, if it if it were, maybe maybe no one would 
maybe no one would watch it again. I don't know. Is Christmas Vacation an annual watch for you? Yeah, I would say pretty pretty close. Yeah, I think there's there's some like my family just was like, let's watch Elf, so we watched that. Um, oh, that's just that's one in ours, which is insane. Oh. Elf is one of our big ones too. We we do that, and I feel so like Buddy's probably fifty now. Buddy's 50. <laughs> Will Ferrell is still very funny, but yes, the last time I saw him, I was like, "Whoa, he's looking old." <laughs> Doesn't look like <laughs> Buddy the Elf. Real old. All right, I'll go. Um, this one, it, Dumb and Dumber, is it's top of one my of list. The best. It's it's a film that I I still watch it and I know the jokes are coming I can you know I know them <laughs> verbatim and yet <laughs> that's, that's I fun. still laugh every time it's um and I <laughs> I think there's I still get a little something you know something more or I'll find something and there's a spark in that movie I like the, that movie has heart it it's does. not just well well written jokes or like scatological like lowbrow like easy pick and humor but like it really has heart and jim carrey's just electric he's jokes build so i mean like there's all sorts of stuff (laughs) i'm just laughing just thinking about it i haven't seen it in a couple of years samsonite i was so close (laughs) i I quote it at least every other day um but one of the that was one of the one of the reasons or one of the ways i found out i was getting old is when i started quoting it and you know, I started getting looks like, what? I, I don't get it. That's fine. <laughs> oh, that's right. So you're I'm saying old. there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> or just by itself, this yeah. pretty bird, like when I see a bird, I'll sometimes <laughs> yeah, yeah. say that. <laughs> uh, his facial expressions are just, he's, in, he's incredible. He's just, he's so good for the role. He just nails it. Love it. Love it. Really uh, funny, and, but very human. Like that movie, oh, yeah. I would not no. necessarily champion as substantive. But it is right. a, because those guys, they're, they're dopes, but like there is a lot of heart and like humanity behind it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when he, when he comes back, when he's on the scooter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, I mean, it, it, yeah. My other one, I think in a genre that kind of lends itself to, a, you know, frivolous um, is the rock, you know, and the action um action i thought about action when i saw the rock i was excited i was like i'd like let's talk the rock that's a fun one yeah and it's you know it's it's in the criterion collection is it really (laughs) is it really yeah i think i saw saw a criterion cover of it armageddon and the rock somehow got into the criterion collection when they were putting out dvds in the early years i think the idea was to make money (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and get some popular movies in there. Some of the additions here and there, the film community online goes, okay, and these are the ones that are going to pay for all the other ones that like, we're yeah. really excited about. Um, so, it, I mean, it's just got everything that you just, that visually you kind of just want to watch, you know, it's got the guns, it's got that cars, car chases, the action explosions. Um, I mean, it really makes it, a character out of San Francisco. Like you, like you, there's all sorts yeah. of things going on there. That nerve gas crap is pretty gnarly at the beginning. Yeah. That's right. one that I saw far too young. Um, <laughs> how old was I when that came out? Wait, was that like a 98 or 99, 97? Mm, yeah. I want to say late nineties. Don't quote me, but that's when it feels, feels like a 96. So I was seven when that came out and I definitely saw more of it than I should have. Mm-hmm. when uh, we got it on VHS. So maybe the VHS came out and I was like eight or nine, but yeah, so I was pretty young I was, when I first saw that. I was a, I, what, a sophomore in high school, I guess. I love a good, you know, a smart, you know, yeah. like having um, Kevin or Sean Connery in it. You know, the one who kind of the guy who knows everything and he's like, he'll, I'll get you through this and can get, get out of any situation. You know, he, you know, when he's, getting but you also haircut, don't know if, you also don't know if the the hero quote can trust him, like right, right. Like there's that that all that secondary kind of like, will he do the right thing or not? Yeah, like, yeah. Who? Yeah, a, and a, at, at the movie. end, you know, is he gonna? That's what it comes down to. Is he gonna do right, the right, right thing or? Right. Um, but it's it's not it's not heavy. There isn't a whole lot of like. There's no deep meaning behind it. I don't think that I, I none that I've found anyway. It's just a fun fun film to watch. But I'll say on that one, from a movie, from like a filmmaking perspective, 
like beauty might be a str- like beauty and goodness might be a stretch if you're going like full on transcendental, but like it was a really well made movie. That's another one. I haven't seen it in years, but like I can vividly pull up like the the guys like melting at the beginning with the nerve gas. I can <laughs> right. pull up the Ferrari car chase. I can pull up mm-hmm. the interrogation where like he cuts the thing with the quarter the haircut on the roof. Like there's a lot of really great set pieces, like coming out of the shower. Like there's a lot of like, really like they just executed that at a very high level. I Mm -hmm. very clearly remember those green balls like rolling. Yeah. Is he going to, is he going to get it? Well, yeah. When he has to like, and he dives down, but you can't, because it can't crush. Cause if it crushes, then everybody. And a bad guy with like a point, not saying like, right. Sure. Holy right, but like this generation, like Killmonger from Black Panther was kind of that, but like the bad guy had a lot of good points. Right, right. In that right. movie. He's not in, t- he's not like you don't. Legitimate like, grievances. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not like, oh, he's horrible. Everybody should kill him. Like you have. Or you even have- just like he's not Hans from Die Hard where he's just a thief. Right. Like yeah. he was wronged and he's seeking vengeance in a. Uh, non-admirable way, but like mm-hmm. he also has a point. Like this country does not treat our veterans very well, right? I think I think that's what you know. Those sorts of things where you start to wonder. Then, like it, it actually can be substantive in the sense that it makes you start to think. Like, okay, well, maybe the good guys are not the good guys I thought, and maybe the bad guys aren't the bad guys. Like, there's a little bit of moral ambiguity. And- totally. You know, I, I, I mean, I understand, okay, sometimes I want to see a movie where you have like white hats and black hats, right? But but at the same time, most of the time, I want to see like real human like ambiguity because people are not all good or all bad. Like, you know, nuance is, is very – nuance will make the story richer and have like lasting value. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So my uh, frivolous ones, they were top of mind um, – was it this year or last year? So I picked my first one is Jackass Forever slash Jackass 4.5, like the bonus one that came out on Netflix. Those guys, <laughs> I just feel like are my homies for like, I've, they've been around forever. Like when the show first, when like the DVDs and VHSs got like passed around and then like they got the MTV show. Yeah. Like it's dumb, it's silly. But like for me, the substance, like it isn't like wildly substantive, but like there's a true camaraderie. Like those guys love each other. Yeah. And it's dumb. It's silly. Like it's like wild, wild stuff they're doing (laughs) to themselves and to one another. But I mean, like at the the newest movie, Jackass Forever, like when I saw that uh, in the theater, like I teared up at the end when they dedicated it to one of the guys who died like previously, yeah. like, cause they've been doing this for like 20 something From one years. of their stunts. No, no, no this was no, just, no. Uh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. an auto accident. <laughs> well, some people think, no, it was like an auto accident, but, um, but I mean, I remember seeing the second or third one. Like I just have a lot of memories attached to those movies. So they're frivolous, but for me, they're very like sentimental. Um, I think it was the third movie. I have a vivid memory of almost throwing up on <laughs> this person in front of me in the theater. It was one of the grossest things. That, like thinking about it, I, if I think deeply about that scene, I might even gag. But have you guys seen any of those movies? I don't yeah. necessarily recommend I, them to everybody. The horse. I don't know if I've to. seen them. I don't know if I've seen Jackass Forever. But I, there was a time when uh, my now seventeen-year-old son. His uncle and cousin, uh, you know, this is a perfect seventeen-year-old movie. I think. Um, Wait, what do you mean? His, his uncle, uncle, his Your son's uncle, his, on my my wife's brother. Oh, okay. I was like, because I'm um, his uncle. Yeah, <laughs> where's but, uh, the story my, going? My yeah, uh, his uncle, whose name is Jay. <laughs> no, um, my my wife's brother and his. So and then the cousin on that side, they were talking about how they saw these, and so then we watched. I watched several and. Like there's something there is, I think, I feel like it's a very like male humor. I mean, I, my wife walk, walk is, through, my wife gross. walks through and she's like, what do you, what even, what, do you, what is this? And uh, I've read a number <laughs> of, so when forever came out, there were both people on letterbox, but actually legitimate critics who pointed out, like, it's not like a one-to-one. 
But like some of the stuff those guys are pulling off is genuinely impressive. It's a number of people uh, cited that they're kind of similar to like the Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin of like our generation, mm. just with very <laughs> scatological yeah, 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 and yeah. like gross stuff. No, the scene in the third one. Have you seen Jackass 3D? Also, very yeah, impressive use of 3D technology. You. No, the sweatsuit cocktail where the fat guy stripped down uh, and went and they, they wrapped him up with saran wrap, put him on a treadmill, <laughs> and then like collected all of his sweat and another guy drank it. Yeah. Like, I, I, I came. That's the one, that's so the one where you almost threw up. Be, literally. I remember this girl's head in front of me. I almost pooped all over it. I was so close. My friends were like egging me on. Like I plugged my ears and eyes as that unfolded. But yeah. one I wanna, of the least I want to thank you. In my life. Thank you for bringing this one up because um, I saw. I feel this, like I that's saw, a good frivolous choice. It's. A good I saw choice. this. No, it's a perfect frivolous one. I saw the. I saw Jackass Forever in the theater and. As much as I want to think that I'm a mature, you know, this old <laughs> mature guy, I was crying in the theater because it's so <laughs> funny. And I just, it, it's just this reaction that watching these, um, even now, I even I watch the old ones. Like, I just can't help it. I'm going to. Every laugh. now and then I go back a couple of times a year. I go back and watch the slap where it's the just the giant hand pull back around the corner that's just knocking oh, yeah. people over as they come by. It's one of the greatest things. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, T-ball in the crotch like I don't know. Just, it's funny. It's funny. My my favorite skit from Jackass Forever. And I, I rewatched it um this morning cuz um it's the I think they call it the Silence of the Lambs where they um so good. I, so I, good. I was crying in the theater. They um <laughs> they put they put them in this room and they basically get them to think that there's going to be a rattlesnake in there and then they turn off all the lights and then they like knock over the bucket and you know they make the Taze sounds each other and it cuz they think that there's this real snake in the room and they're just freaking out and it's the funniest thing. It's you know it there, is there is the one with snakes with like anacondas in the ball pit. Yes. Oh, with Bam, who like hated snakes. <laughs> yeah, and he was legitimately he's like oh, brought yeah. to tears. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of those. Like, there's one yeah. where he's like in that. It's like oh, a the ball trailer. Yeah, yeah, no, I remember. Yeah, yeah. There's one with like and there were two snakes. Yeah, there's one like in a big a trailer with yes. cages, and they, like he can't get out of the room. Yeah. But but there's yeah. the one where they're in the ball pit the ball and they don't pit. they don't know where the big like boa constr- I don't know if they're anaconda yeah. or whatever they are. There were and, and like, there were actually two instead of one. They yeah, found right, right, right. Out, and then the other one popped out. <laughs> yeah. It's it's yeah, so interesting it's that other people's fear is so funny. Like and I think <laughs> I think deep down we I think we know that I mean they might get hurt but they're not going to die and for some reason like that makes it funny. Like people their their genuine fear of something could happen to them. That's it's like the funniest thing. I don't know. I, I thought the one where they kidnapped the guy and put him in the trunk. And oh, like, oh, man. Gosh. So uh, good. One of <laughs> all time greatest. And he's yeah. got the, the, the hair on his face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like the, the cherry it's on like top when he gets a, out. And a, they're a, like, oh, by the way. Guess it's like on jokes, oh, jokes on jokes on jokes. Like the, the layers of the. And then the other one I remember is the like the airplane engine one where they're trying to stand there and they're very <laughs> he's sitting in the chair <laughs> behind the the engine yeah. and just like we're just have a jet engine and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. And there's a dance scene. Is that the one where they at the end they have the dance scene like they're With all the yeah. stuff exploding? Yeah, and they're like falling yeah. down and like yeah, they're like they're, high quality clowns with like yeah. million yeah. dollar budgets. Right. Right. Oh. So it's a good choice. It's a good choice. So Great choice. that's that's just a lot of fun. And then I picked the original, um, The Evil Dead, because Evil Dead Rise came out at the beginning of the year. So I did a, a rewatch of the whole series, which is not very many films. And then um, I think a year or two ago, the Blank Check podcast did Sam Raimi. So I went back and listened to all that too. And they're just fun. So I was thinking like in the conversation about like, Faith and substance, like that is not a movie I would recommend to like a normal person, quote unquote. <laughs> Just like off like, oh, you like movies? What's a movie you recommend? Oh, The Evil Dead. Like, I'm not gonna right. do that. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people of faith may have pause or just disinterest. And like we both had Josh Larson on the show. I'm totally fine with not everybody needs to be 
a horror fan, but I think that there can be a lot of interesting things that horror talks about. But even on the frivolous side, it's just fun. Like watching that first movie, I just had a blast seeing like basically a big a, a group of kids like just their ingenuity. Like I don't know if you guys know the story behind it. Like basically like. Sam Raimi like went to all of his parents, rich friends and all the doctors in town and got a bunch of tiny loans and went out and made this movie. Like I love that as well as the splatter and the silliness and the one. He had like made a short, right? Like wasn't it, wasn't there a short? He did do a short and then he went to more doctors and dentists and slightly larger surrounding areas. And like, I, I like went a deep dive. I watched a bunch of the documentaries on the disc and stuff. Like they were telling stories about him, going around showing the short version like to one story he told was like a guy who owned a bunch of supermarkets in one town like he actually brought in like a screen and like his like projector and showed it to him in his supermarket and being like hey like we're trying to get money to make like a full length and he got a couple grand from him and just like i i love the whole thing and what it's become like it's a fun movie it's it's a lot of fun to watch but i i also personally love how like just what it did for movies and what it did for the people involved and kind of how it launched careers like Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi are two guys who I love, but even the the smaller players, like if they want to, some of those people have careers just going around to conventions, like signing stuff and like their lives were changed. And like, to me, like, I just think that's very special. So if not substantive, maybe slightly frivolous, like it's like a splatter horror movie, but it's fun. I feel like I, should be embarrassed about this, but I watched it for the first time last night and, uh, it, it, uh, so one thing I noticed on, on, uh, IMDB actually in the credits, I was like, is that the same Joel Cohen? Like Joel Cohen. Oh yeah. Yeah. uh, Assistant film editor or something. Cohen brothers. Yeah. Um, They were like roommates or something for a little while. And then he, he also was like an assistant editor on, another 1981 horror that I have not seen. Um, that was fresh in my mind earlier this year. They something. met Sam Raimi and the Coens met on working on somebody else's movie. And then Sam said, Hey, like, why don't you help me with mine as well? And that's kind of how that went. And off. I think you know, they kind of repaid it and helped uh, the Coens get one of their films. Made. Yes. There's a, there's a section. So the, the section where it's basically just Ash and he comes in back into the house and like the whole thing in the basement where he's getting the shotgun and there's the whole tube of blood falls on him. And this, <laughs> that whole, that whole section before, before the evil, the evil dead come back into the house. That was, I was like, this is, and I thought it was pretty close to the end. So I was like, this is like the, most of the time I feel like some of those horrors, like the first, two thirds is good. And then it falls apart in the last, uh, to me that, that section was so like the way just, he just throws everything out in there. Like let's turn the camera upside down. Like let's, let's do all yeah. he's in a dream. Like it's all this crazy stuff. Um, and so I, uh, and it's probably one where I was like, Oh, my stomach <laughs> It's pretty gnarly. And I, I have no defense and neither now does Sam Raimi, no defense for the tree scene. Very unnecessary. Right. I heard but it's, it's he's got some regrets about putting that in. Yes. There. Which is yeah, an interesting conversation too. Like you feel like, oh, in that genre, exploitation is part of it. So, okay, fine. Let's throw that in there. Well, and I mean, they did it in reverse too. So like I'm sure filming it wasn't very traumatic either. But to watch the scene, it's a hard scene to watch. Oh, and I is. remember yeah. the first time I saw the movie, I was like, oh, I don't like this movie. I'm right. I'm a part two guy. Like this, this movie's gross. But then – this time when I rewatched it, I was like, I, I love the heart, but even that, like, that's an interesting, uh, yeah, thing to think about and discuss as well. And I do kind of like how publicly there is the, not like apologizing for the art, but going like that was a decision that I would not make now. I, I respect said, that. I haven't seen the second one, but people were saying like this is it was it's essentially a remake. Is that accurate? <sighs> yes and no. It's sillier and more slat it's more three stooges um probably even more blood because they had a better budget it's many of the similar beats like <laughs> it does do a lot of the same things the first one does 
with more money, more blood, but also more comedy. Yeah. One of the things so, I liked how, you know, with not having the big budget, you know, they got creative with a lot of things, you mm-hmm. know, how it starts out the whole, just the POV view, you know, coming just a couple inches off the ground, the, um, and just how they just moved fisherman. the camera. I thought that was hilarious. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Just how they'd move the camera around, you know, they'd, um, things, shots that you would think are POV, like, okay, that's where, you know, the, you know, demon possessed person's supposed to be. And then you pull out and it's not. And how they, yeah, no, that whole, creative. that, the camera of like the evil going around in the forest. Like that yeah. was the yeah. pioneer technology of the steady cam. Like steady cam didn't exist during that. Right. Yeah. I heard they like hook it up to a couple two by fours. Like, yep. Ramey and just uh, ran around the through the swamp. I right. I mean that the fog and the light in the movie, that's what, those are two things that I kind of noticed. Like it's constantly, you know, just, it's so the way things are lit from behind or from, you know, the front, to make shadows or to make uh, like, I, I, I just noticed that over and over just kind of different, you know, when they're kind of have this perspective at the doorway and there's kind of light behind or, or vice versa. Um, I, there are lots of impressive things. I feel like there are lots of impressive things that maybe took some time later to <clears throat> kind of coalesce into a totally. Just, well, and that's why I picked that one too. Cause it's, it is, I love seeing where those things start in filmmakers as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so some good conversation for our frivolous section. That was just the frivolous I mean, stuff. Yeah. And we're, we're, have we, <laughs> all right, I guess we're on to you, Tim, serious oh. ones. Uh, so my serious, um, and these are, I mean, Calvary is probably at the, just at the top of my list because I how love much, Calvary. how much it's meant to me personally and how much at, a, at like a very particular time you know, I'm not, I'm not a Roman Catholic priest, so there's obviously differences there, but, um, but it just, the way that he goes about his work in that place to me is such a, I just don't, I just don't see this very often where, where clergy have this kind of, um, uh, outlook, just a very calm until a certain point in the movie, but a very calm, like, like you, th- you think he should be doing more. That's what, that was my thought throughout the movies. Like he should be doing more stuff. Like he's just been told these kind of, and he, he's, he just goes about his, his work and it's become sort of, for me, it's become sort of a uh, kind of overriding theme. Uh, in fact, I, this is kind of, maybe it's kind of silly. I don't know. I, I kind of, re- I kind of wrote a book, an entire book about based on the theme that sort of came to me watching Calvary. So that's, that's how serious I take. Um, wow. and then, uh, a hidden life is my other one that I just think there's so much, I mean, you could, anybody could probably pick any Malick film, but, uh, for me, a hidden life, it's so much in the visuals. It's so much in the, um, there there's, it's, it's probably more straightforward story wise from than other Malick films. But, but, uh, for me, just, just the profound Christianity of that movie is so much I, I, there's just very few films like so yeah and the you know Malik taking on the Christianity I think it's it's something uh he does well especially you know put in taking that kind of that heft or that that serious of a topic of what the guy is going through in that kind of situation during the war and everything and then putting in like the the Malik visuals I think it's 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 really incredible what they were able to do with it. Um, and then with, with Calvary, I think, you know, lately, or, you know, we see a fair amount of these priests as real people, you know, kind of films. You it's know? starting to come back a little bit, thankfully. It's nice. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I don't think Calvary was, you know, let's, I'm not going to say it's the, the first one or anything, but I think it does, you know, it, it treats the clergy, um, you know, as real people and putting them in real situations and having to make, you know, real decisions. And I think it's one that it puts a real genuine feel and touch on it. And I think that's what, I think that's what makes it so powerful um, to me is that it just feels so, so genuine. Calvary was a movie that I saw here at an old art theater in Kansas city. That's now closed sadly. And that was before I was married, may, may or may not have been dating my wife. I don't think I was. So, I mean, that was one of the first movies I saw here when I moved to Kansas City. And I just remember having a 
just a transcendent experience in the theater. Like from the very jarring and intense opening, like it, the movie grabs you right away. And it also lets you know, again, if you're a, a person of faith, sometimes that can mean having more like uh, sensitive standards. So like if you get past the first like two minutes, you can kind of decide like whether this movie's for you or not. But if you buy in, it's just, yeah, it's, it's an incredible movie. And I love those filmmakers, um, the, the McDonough brothers. I, yeah. I like a lot of what they do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought Brennan Gleason was excellent. You don't see good clergy um, enough in the world or in the media. And, and I'm, there are so many, but a lot of times uh, the ones who are not uh, utilizing their position very well are often the ones who get the spotlight um, for better and worse. Um, so I really enjoyed so just speak. seeing that. So yeah. Speak, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get there uh, on my pick there. Um, but th- that was nice to see, but just the theme of like love and forgiveness, obviously in a very heightened stylized extreme setting. But I, I just thought that that was yeah. fantastic. I'm sure we'll cover it on the show at some point. I mean, I mean for me, the, the, he's such a good, he's such a wise person i mean that that's something that just strikes me is how how wise he is he doesn't like overreact i mean again there's there's one scene where he there's part way through the movie where something kind of because he's human right yeah it pushes him over the edge and and uh but but throughout he's just uh he's just a he's very grounded and uh like he's not too he's not like distant from the people's exactly lives. He's, he's not well it, that, that whole that old adage of like being so heavenly minded you're of no earthly good his power really came from like his humanity and it wasn't divorced from the spirituality but he wasn't like an academic a high, like one of those pastors who spends 40 hours a week studying to preach for one hour like he was a man of the people like the movie followed him throughout the week as he visited all these eccentric characters in his parish or whatever. And who, like, who don't, who don't really like him. Like huh. there are very few of the people there who like, yes, we have a good relationship. And yet he's still good. Like to me, that's, this is a, you know, this, I, I'm more of an introvert, I suppose. And so like, I, I always get a lot out of like actually visiting with people, but the actual sort of impetus to go and visit them is, is probably more difficult for me, but he, he does, he just does it. Even like though a true shepherd, like, yes, even though he knows was, they're going to, yeah. they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They don't care about him. They don't, they want him to leave. They want him to leave them alone, <clears throat> but they are all at different places and they have, some of them have, you know, the doctor has very serious, uh, what's that guy's name? He's a great actor. Um, and then you have the, his brother, it's his brother, right? Who plays the the cr- the criminal? Um, and then you have uh, his son. Oh, it's his son. I haven't uh, seen it in a while. I don't then, remember all the characters, but yeah, like everybody, like it's Christmas, one of those towns where like, Christmas, everybody Christmas goes O'Dowell. to church, yes. but nobody right. is particularly pious. Chris Chris O'Dowd is is great. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know. I love the I love the movie, and it's at the top of it's at the very top of my top one hundred. Not necessarily because it's like the best movie I've ever seen, but just because it it had such an impact on me. No, it's a great one. Then I was going to say A Hidden Life. Watched it a few times. Then we did it. We did it uh, for the show on the relaunch. And it's, I'm sure Malik didn't intend because I knew he'd been cooking it up for a while. But it is really interesting to watch that movie about a man's a man's virtues and um, values tested in a time of rising nationalism and fascism and things like that. It's just, it's an interesting watch in the world we live in today, especially again, added with just the overwhelming beauty of the cinematography and the poetry. And um, I think of that one scene with the artist. And I feel like that was Malik himself wrestling with like the art he creates versus like him saying like he is striving for, something more transcendent. And I'm really curious to see his, uh, his new movie on Jesus, whenever that gets done with the edit in two or three years. I think what a uh, thing, common theme that shows up in a lot of these films is 
that they bring up the question of, you know, what would I do in that situation? Or would I be as strong as this person is? Or are, is my faith as strong as these, this person is? Um, which kind of segues into my, my film, which is <laughs> Silence, which tackles, um, I mean, a lot of the same, a lot of the same things that, uh, you know, the guy in the a hidden life is, um, so this is, you know, I, I saw this film, um, fairly early on. And then, um, I came across the book and was able to read the book. And what the book did was, uh, made me want to watch the film again. And I think that was cause it, it, the book maybe seems a little stronger in this whole, cause I mean, it's the same dealing with, you know, the persecution and would I be able to do this? Is my faith this strong? It's, those a lot of those same questions and hey, like what is required for faithfulness i felt like was a great question of that too yeah and like is is this good enough you know or what if i just did this and i would be would i be compromising my faith if i if i just said you know if i just you know kneel down here if i just yeah. said this but in my mind i didn't really mean it you know am i really you know a i think we hit I think this is kind of what we talk. We have, I think we have an episode on temptation and I think, I think this is really the, the theme is temptation in both of those movies is you, what you have an episode on temptation or the last temptation of Christ? No, it will. It's on silence, hidden life and temptation. In other words, in other words, the temptation for both Rodriguez is the same, essentially the same thing. Like what's the big deal? Like, 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 is it yeah. really that big of yeah. de- a, a deal if you step on this or if you sign this? Like to me, that's the that's the relationship between those two movies. Is like, yes, th- it's is it a big deal? Because there are people telling you it's not a big deal, but in your heart, you're like, this is a this is the this is the line between faithfulness and unfaithfulness. And so I feel like those films have a have that in common. That that this is not you know one of Scorsese's you know like highest highest films you know when when people talk about scorsese it's typically not one that's even brought up and yet i mean i think you know i think it's one of his strongest and it's and i don't know if that's because of the faith aspect is because people are put off by that or what it is but for some reason this is not um brought up as much as it should i feel like and very interestingly i i know we got to move on but i will say that I remember in the press for Killers of the Flower Moon, which just came out and I thought was excellent. um, One interviewer asked him, I thought it was a really good question. Like which, which characters of yours are you most concerned about like their souls? And one of the people he answered was Andrew Garfield's character. And I was like, well, like out of all the characters, like Hmm. (laughs) that you've put on the screen, like that's one of the top ones. And I I thought that was very interesting. (laughs) Uh, along with that, I had Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is, I mean, this is, is my top, this is my top favorite film of all time. Um, it doesn't bring up, I mean, it doesn't get as heavy as a lot of these other ones that we've been talking about. Um, I guess in that sense, it's maybe even a little lighter, but it does. I just love the themes and I love. Love is a very transcendent topic. <laughs> true, true. True. Um, this idea that you're, you, you know, if you're meant to be with someone, then you're going to be with someone, you know, as much as, you know, you can try and fight it, but there's something there that's going to bring that person back to you. And I thought, which I, I just, I love the, uh, the idea of it. And I love the, it's got the, uh, the fantastic elements to it where it's not, you know, this couldn't actually happen at least right, not right now. So it's got, you know, the fantastic elements, uh, the fantasy, um, and it's just beautifully, beautifully told. And I just love, I love it. It's, it's, it's artistic. It's, yeah, it's just good. And I love the themes. And so that's my, that's my. No, it's that I remember when, when that first came out, I watched that a lot of times. And yeah. You no, know, it, it's a very touching movie and I'll, I'll uh, transition that to one of mine. Like I love the, what some of my uh, internet friend group calls lo-fi sci-fi. Like I love that genre of like, doesn't have to be super far in the future and the Mm -hmm. tech doesn't have to be super crazy to where it's high budget. But um, one of mine is in the similar vein was after Yang, Um, a very simple premise of this family has an Android sibling for their daughter 
who breaks down and they're trying to figure out they're they're going through some struggles like uh, financially and relationally and instead of buying a new android because they're expensive they're trying to get them repaired and just the question of humanity and existence and memories and beauty and like what is really like this move like i love like the androidy like what is humanity what does it mean mm-hmm. to be alive and live a life and souls and all that stuff. like those stories like blade runner is one of my favorite movies and that gets at it at a much more kind of popcorn mm-hmm. um stylized enjoyable so, like i i think i put so in my letterbox review after yang was a blade runner um through the lens of terrence malick or something <laughs> like that like it really is like this android's memories like what was the value of this android's life did it have value like he brought joy it he brought joy to this family yang developed relationships with other beings and one of the beings it was a clone like what what does all of that mean and i thought that it was just gorgeous yeah i think i think ai in that film does what architecture in uh in uh columbus does absolutely you know like you just have this like you, through this particular lens let's examine life and I, I i i agree with you like i love i love that <clears throat> just how technically excellent it is but also just you know just human themes that just uh well and just the value as a, a father of young children who can kind of get caught up in other things just watching that movie being reminded of just the beauty and the value of the little moments, like the special, special memories, like inside Yang's like Mm -hmm. uh, memory cortex or whatever, like just the value in those little moments. And I think that that is something that all of us every now and then could use a good reminder of. Yeah. And then my other one tying back, Oh wait, go for it. I was going to say, it's always good to, you know, have a little, um, you know, what does it mean to be human? And, you know, makes us appreciate the good things and really take the time to see um, things from a different perspective and really, you know, see that on film and just be able to relate that to our own lives and be like, yeah, you know what? Things aren't that bad. You know, we, we have some good things, you know, it's, it's not all bad out there. And then kind of the, the inverse, we were talking about good clergy in Calvary. <laughs> My other one, uh, spotlight, man, I don't know if I've felt heavier at the end of a film when just the that wall of names mm. and parishes and cities and victims came up at the end credits of spotlight like that was just truly overwhelming yeah, yeah. and to, to see it come from you know how they start so small or you know they focus on a couple <laughs> um, a couple priests and then it yeah. just a couple bad build, apples yeah and then to build to like all right we're focusing on 13 and then now we're at 87 and now <laughs> what's seen in john slattery is like if there were like 50 we'd know yeah <laughs> right right, right. <laughs> and then at the end you know they the hundreds or you know thousands i forget the final number but it to, was low well i think they said the number the percentage like the yeah. one of the clinicians is like Something six, around six like, percent. yeah, yeah, a not insignificant percent, but it's small enough to go. Oh, that's a small yeah. amount. But then when you go, yeah. how many priests are in the world? Right. Like, yeah. how many priests serve in parishes around the world? Six <laughs> percent. Like, mm-hmm. that's gnarly. And then you see all of the names of the ones that we're sure about. Yeah, have yeah. abused people, and just yeah. and it shows all the cities. And I'm like looking like. Wait, yeah, I know where that right. is. I, yeah, that's, that's my wife grew up there. Hey, wait, it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and really that did it did blow up in terms of like recognition and uh, acknowledgement of what of the reality of things. That like it wasn't like even. I mean, I remember that time period. Like people are like, yeah, like so. Um, and it's it's a little weird. Like um, so, I I wear clerical collar like most of the time and and i i've never had anybody like like throw things at me or like yell at me but i i feel like that it wouldn't be too far off like um you know like i in fact i had a professor uh one time who said what's the f- what's the word that people think of when they see the collar 
And uh, it starts with a P. You know, you got classmates who are like pastor, priest, whatever. No, no, that's not the first word that starts with P that people think of. It's pedophile. Like, like, I, like that. <clears throat> now that hasn't stopped me from wearing a collar, but, but I, I feel like that's a, that's a reality that that you have yeah. to sort of deal with in terms of the world. And um, it's a, it really is a, it's a really, you know, I, I, you feel the sort of the, the con conflictual uh, sort of existence of people in there. Like where I grew up Catholic, I grew up like in this, I grew, I went to this church or whatever. And they, I went to this school and I knew this priest or whatever. Like you feel that in the movie. So. Well, and kind of what you touched on there a little bit, one of the scenes that, I thought was the most touching was the, the Mark Ruffalo one towards the end where he was kind of confiding. Like one of the reasons why this was so hard for him is like, he's not a super devout person right now, but like he reveals, and I don't know how real this was to the character, but he was like, I always figured like I'd come back to it. Like mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, just the way, because he didn't have like a vital active faith, but he had the foundation that he's kind of like, you know, like later on in life, like people come back to it in their older age. Like he kind of verbalized, like I was, I was kind of looking forward to coming back to that in my old age, kind of how that just was a crisis of faith for so many people because, mm-hmm. yeah. and then that's like a whole nother discussion. Like we shouldn't have faith in the institutions or right, in the right, people, right. but like, that's a real thing. Like the abuse of that, that role had a serious impact on people's actual faith. Right. Right. And, and that's, that's yeah, something yeah. very serious. Yeah. I tell people all the time, like, don't, don't put your trust in me. Like I'm, I'm a sinner, but at the same time, like you can't be like, that means I can do whatever I want and don't, you know, like, I mean, there certainly not like there's a, there's a, there's a clear responsibility that clergy have toward people and as much as you can say it's not about another sinner there is some there is a there is a responsibility in terms of of sort of moral you know standing that you can't just you can't just say in other words that can't be an excuse you can't no. you, you can't you can't sort of use that as a rationalization of whatever faults there might be okay well it's all about this or whatever i mean you do i, I mean the scriptures i think are pretty clear about like be careful if you want to be be considered a teacher like that's a yeah. no, I mean, power gets abused in all realms yeah. but when the spiritual power gets abused yeah. that that harms people in many ways and in very deep ways and i thought that that movie was a very somber look at at that so very serious indeed there's it still these movies like we we can talk about them my wife before I came over here to record, she's like, she's like, uh, how could you even, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how I could talk about that for the whole time. I'm like, no, no, no can, <laughs> that's not going to be a problem. Like, cause trying to explain to her what my idea was in terms of, of the interaction of the way people view movies, like, like even when you call it like even, okay. Movies versus film. Like right, sure. I'm, I'm going cinema. to. A, Ooh. I'm going. I'm going to a film. I'm not it's going true. to a movie. Like even I do the way delineate we, sometimes. <laughs> even even though we talk about it, you know, and I've been dealing with this in terms of uh, I've been I've been what I once upon a time in Hollywood. I'm I'm writing this this thing about it, and just like going back and forth and like how people view Tarantino, how they view his like he he only will work he'll only film things on film. Right. So he doesn't do any digital. And yet like some people like, Oh, that's a, okay. That's a good move. But like, is there something serious going on here or is there something, is this just, I want to entertain you. Like Jay and I've talked about numerous times. If you can stir people up to like be on opposite sides of things and like argue about it, like you've done something that's significant. You, you've done, you've made it, you've made a film that, has like you don't just dismiss it right mm-hmm. so and i'm sure jay you're the one with the degree here um, <laughs> love to get your like film is a medium mm-hmm. like if you only go to a movie theater a couple times a year to see 
comic book movies or a Liam Neeson action movie or whatever. Like that's fine. That's not bad. Like plenty of people do that, but there, there is a lot to it and whether it's intended to be frivolous or if it's intended to be more serious, that's, I think, I mean, I, I think there are some movies that have almost no value, but <laughs> I, I think that as a whole, um, a, a wider range than, than some may think um, has value. I think, I mean, it's like with any art form, you know, you can, you can, I guess, almost decide how much you want to get from it, you know, and you can, a lot of times you can pull things from films or you're like, oh, I really think, see this, or I saw this, um, you know, where the, you know, the directors or the filmmaker was like, yeah, I wasn't even trying to put that in there. Um, mm-hmm. Where's that, there's that film, I think room 213 about the shining or something. Sure. And it's basically just people going down rabbit holes and like, oh, well, I saw this on a king. A lot of theories on that movie. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, so I, but I think that's kind of what, what makes film fun, you know? And I think no matter what, there's always, even the films that we call frivolous, um, like, like Jackass, like you were, like you were talking, you know, I mean, it's kind of a buddy film, you know, it's about these guys and having that relationship with, these guys and there's always there i think there's always something more in films and i think that's what makes film theory and you know watching films i that's what i love about it is trying to find like dig into it and find out what's really going on and trying to find stuff um you know what's the filmmaker really trying to say and that's you know like like i mentioned you know like any art form there's there's something there's a lot more there than you know typically what you'll watch or what you'll see on the first time I think I think it's it, it's interesting to talk to people who, when you sort of feel this connection with the film, and other people are like, "I didn't get, I got nothing. Like, like that didn't impact me at all. Like something, there's something there in terms of where it, whether you're coming from a particular place that connects with something that the filmmaker is doing. And uh, I've I've just thought about this a lot. Like in terms of, it really depends on a lot of your the value that you put into or take out of a movie really depends on where you are at the moment like you, totally. you just you just don't and so and sometimes i see a movie and i'm like i got nothing and then i'll see it 10 years later and i'm like whoa like i missed mm-hmm. all of that and uh so i think that's i think i think like books you could you could read a book and then as a child and then read it as an adult and totally it'd be something totally different on the frivolous side of things like sometimes like a little bit of like silliness, like can really help you get through the drudgery of yeah. life. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't know how serious it is, but I loved seeing nobody in the theater. Like it was like one of the first films I saw back in. After, oh like, yeah. The theater. Odenkirk. Yeah. Yeah. That I mean, was like, fun. And in fact, I think there are some substantive things there, but besides that, like just watching just like a, just like kind of, go over the top, you know, kind of action <laughs> sure. uh, in a certain sense. It's just something like that's what movies are for, right? Like uh, yeah. in a lot of ways. And uh, if you take something more good, if you don't, okay, you had a good time at the theater. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well it's good to connect with you guys. Yeah, it's always it's great fun. to uh, talk with other film lovers, especially when they're uh, people mm-hmm. of faith. Where, uh, what do you guys have anything special coming up that you want to plug or where can people find you guys? So we're at uh, saints of cinema.com is our website. All our episodes are up there. And uh, I think uh, we're probably going to do, I mean, I don't know, probably maybe it's after the first of the year, we'll do a best of 2023. It's been a good year. There are so many movies that I didn't get to see this year. Like I know when I get to like probably a half dozen or more movies that they're all going to eventually be on my top 10 when I able to have some time. Yeah. There's still a couple, um, looking forward to poor things. Um, sure. Maestro coming up yep. and, uh, um, haven't seen anatomy of a fall or past lives yet either. I haven't those seen are past both lives. Two I w- those are two. I want to see. Um, f- so for saints and cinema listeners, um, you can find the substance wherever you get your podcasts. We're, at the substance pod on the socials. And we do have a website. It hasn't been kept up. I need to get on that at some point, but search whatever your podcatcher is, share it with a friend, or like I said, at the substance pod on the, on the socials. 
we'll put the links uh we'll put the links in our our show notes and thanks so much thanks yeah, for this reaching out thanks yeah thank for... you oh, it was my pleasure have a good night guys Well, that was Tim and Jay Winterstein of the Saints and Cinema podcast. Really enjoyed hanging with those guys. And yeah, like like we said, I will stay in touch with them and see if it can make sense. Uh, maybe get some sponsors to have me go over and uh, cover their film festival. That would be super exciting. So check them out at Saints and Cinema, where you get your podcast or saintsandcinema.com. We'll be sure to put the links in the show notes for that. A couple of plugs here for other shows. I don't think we've done this before. So if you're still listening and you want to get some more um, movie shows featuring yours truly, I've guested on a few shows lately. So I want to be sure to shout those out. Uh, very, I think my most recent one, I was uh, with my buddy, my internet friend, Seth on Movie Friends. We covered Godzilla Minus One. Incredible movie. Had a great time talking with him. Um, if you guys have been here for a while and remember our episode that we did with David, who used to run the Kaiju Apostle podcast with, on the original Godzilla movie, I think those two episodes will go nicely together. The new movie was great. The more I think about it, the more I like it. I try not to, I, I tend towards <laughs> superlative speech. Um, so I don't want to say, oh, it was the best, but I mean, I, it's, it's a strong contender for top five, maybe top three. It was a, a wonderful, wonderful movie. Had a great time talking with Seth. Last month, to close out November, Mike White over at the Projection Booth, uh, he published our episode that we did on Sam Fuller's The Naked Kiss. If you guys remember, quite a while ago, I shouted out Sam Fuller. He's one of my favorite directors, one of my favorite directors to turn people onto because he's he's not very well known now, especially. I mean, a lot of the big directors now, especially the older ones, they cite him as a source of inspiration. They love his work. And I, I always get excited when I hear them shout him out so that more people will go back. But uh, in my estimation, I, I feel like The Naked Kiss is maybe one of his best movies. I had a wonderful, wonderful time uh, talking with Mike uh, on his show about that because it's one of my favorite movies and the episode itself. Both of the stars of the film Two of the three stars who are still alive, they're over 90, and Mike got interviews with them as well. So if you're into film noir or if you just want to hear me talk about something that I love and think is incredible that a lot of people haven't seen that I do recommend you check out, I believe it's streaming on HBO and the Criterion channel, but check out the episode on The Naked Kiss. And I don't know, in the last two months maybe when it came out, I don't think I shouted it out here, um, I visited with my friends, Sarah and Jen on Movies and Us, and we covered uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, which is another one of my favorite movies this year. So if you want more movie talk that is not uh, on the Substance feed here, you can go check those shows out. I'll be sure to put links in the show notes. And yeah, we, we appreciate you guys rocking with us this year. The best way to help show your love and support is to share the show with a friend. Uh, text it, put it on your stories, put it on your feed. If you're a TikToker, man, I'm, I'm not stepped into that world yet. Make us a TikTok and say, hey, go listen to The Substance. <laughs> they got all sorts of stuff. They got faith. They got culture. They got movies. They got social justice. They got theology. They got history. So um, if you're on TikTok, maybe somebody could uh, start the uh, advertising campaign over there. Um, and if you haven't and you're still listening, open up your podcatcher, especially if you have Spotify or iTunes or Apple Podcasts now, I'm still saying iTunes, uh, hit the five-star button, write a quick sentence saying why you like the show. It really does help people find us. And if you're interested, if you want to give us a year-end gift, you can do that on Cash App at dollar sign, the Substance Pod. If you want to put a little bit in our stocking there for the joy that we've given you, you can do it there on Cash App, or you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the substance. Uh, patrons over there get early content from editor Dave from his Substack podcast interviews. Uh, listeners get exclusive content from us, and they also get to vote to uh, influence future episodes of The Substance. So if that is something you want to do, that's where you can do it. Um, hope you guys have a wonderful holiday full of rest, sweet times with family, with as little contentiousness as possible. And uh, we're very excited to see you in the new year. So thanks for hanging with us, and we'll see you next time on The Substance. Agreed. What about you, Jay? No, I, 
I think um, I like what you said about the serious one. It has it has something to say. Um, I also think you know good films can uh, you know create create emotion. You know, create um, you know or even action. I mean, you know, you feel strongly about a certain way or about a excuse me. You create you <laughs> you feel strongly. Um, about a, a film like it'll do something to you or it'll in, invoke something within you or hey that's something i want to go in, get involved you know with groups or something like see this and get upset about this like i can't believe this is happening i guess that's more along the lines of like documentaries but um also one genre i was thinking of that didn't show up in any of our lists was like the war genre and i think that one is an interesting one in the sense that what a lot a lot of times those films can instead of like reading about situations um, or hearing about things you get the visual representation of seeing um and seeing the getting the impact that way um so i think that was that was an interesting genre that didn't show up um, so actually i will say one of the first films that i thought about for serious uh was a war movie but I just hadn't seen it in a while and I wasn't, I didn't feel super confident that I could talk about it. I didn't know how in depth we were going to go on it. And it's one that I'm, I'm excited to hopefully cover soon on the show. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't, they weren't on my list, but you know, just recently all quiet on the Western front. I think that one, um, still need to see that one. I heard that was fantastic. It really is. It It really is. You don't, I haven't seen the original. What is 1932 was the, is that? Yeah. And then they did another one in like the seventies. Um, but it really has a visceral impact. And I think the technology was able to give, to provide that visual impact and just cr- create these scenarios that were like, that you really see it where like, yeah, war is awful, which I mean, you see that in pretty much all war films, but it's, it's so evident. I considered bringing up um, Larissa Shapitko's uh, The Ascent, that recently got a Criterion upgrade. It's one of my favorites on the war side, but uh, hmm. not a lot of people know about it. I don't even know if it's got like ten thousand logs on Letterbox. It's not. What uh, what war? Um, I, I think, think it's, it's World War II. Okay, it's a so. Soviet filmmaker. She only made a couple movies. She died pretty young, uh, unfortunately. But Criterion was a like it was a great movie. They put it out on their Eclipse. DVD set. I don't know if you guys remember those where they like Hmm. put criterion level filmmakers, but they put like a bunch of their films and they package them all together Hmm. on DVDs. And then this film got its own separate, like high quality Blu-ray release. And it's, it's very, very good. You know what, what year? Um, Not off the top, but pause for editing here. (laughs) Yeah. I'm it's, uh, it's not familiar to me. So I'm, I'm interested. 77 is when the movie came out. Okay. And really uh, the ascent is the American title and probably a, a more accurate uh, title is the Ascension, but the ascent Mm. is what it's called. Very spiritual, very human, very dark, but also in kind of ways like very uplifting, I'd say too. And I wasn't, I don't love this movie as much as some. I also had this on the top of mind because Roger Deakins just came here to Kansas City at the World War One Memorial and did a big talk and showed 1917. I know some of the local listeners here went, and that was my wife's birthday weekend, so I was not able to go. But no. that was one that I liked, but I feel like people like really, really, really like. Maybe there just hasn't been a great war movie in a while. I felt like people really blew that one up. I liked it. I thought it was good. Yeah, yeah. I might be in the really, really <laughs> liked camp I mean, on I, that one. The the whole, you know, the whole conceit of the, kind of the single. You know, I need it. I didn't see it in the theater, so that mm-hmm. was maybe. Um, I really did love the way it was made. Yeah. The uh, one that's like a horror movie that I saw like in the last year is Come and See. I don't know if you have you seen this. Oh one. yeah, so that actually was uh, Larissa Shapiko's husband. Oh okay okay. Yeah, uh, Elam Klimov. Klimov, yep. Klimov, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that, like, that's like, maybe yeah. that's like war horror. Like, that's like I gotta spend the rest of the day like hiding in the dark. 
or turn yeah. on all the lights. I'm not sure which one <laughs> that is, but uh, I mean, have you seen that one, Jay? We're, we're on the side tangent. Have you seen that yeah, one? Yeah. Come Wait, see. Yeah. No. Oh no, Come I haven't see. seen it. I haven't seen it. Yeah. No, I haven't. It's uh, it's brutal. long, but it's yeah, it's brutal. It's uh, that's one of the top picks that like when film Twitter's like, what's the best movie you've ever seen that you never want to watch again? Like that's one of the yeah, yeah, huh, yeah. Uh, most often cited ones. Um, I mean, the th- and, and speaking of like spirituality and like the thin red line is one I haven't seen for a while. Sure. Um, I have it on DVD. So I should probably just watch it again. But um, anyway. Beards can be deceiving. So you've let a, you've electrocuted a cat, Jay, haven't you? Okay. Let me reset here, Dave. <laughs>